Here's a discussion of the various methods in use in the 1970s for local coin control. What inspired my making this program was Harrisonburg, Virginia. In Harrisonburg, Virginia, a method of local coin control is used which, while not especially earth-shattering, is nonetheless unique. To appreciate Harrisonburg's uniqueness, there first has to be a background in how the rest of the network works. So here's a very thorough discussion of the various coin control methods I've encountered in North America during my telephone travels. The most common method, of course, especially in cities, is what's called prepay. An example would be Fairfield, Connecticut. When you pick up the phone, there's no talk battery on the line. In some places, there are significant power supply noises from the CO as there are here. This is a ground start line, something which is becoming rare nowadays, but they used to be very common. The basic idea is that your line relay, which is a relay that's associated with each phone line, doesn't request dial tone unless there's a ground on the tip of the line. With a prepay coin phone, that ground comes from the phone itself, which doesn't put the ground on until the customer makes the initial deposit. Now the fact that there's no talk battery on the line tells the payphone that it needs to wait for the complete initial deposit before really registering the coin. If there were talk battery on the line, nickels would go right in, but in this condition, a nickel will just be held until a second nickel gets in. Then the ground is made, and then the central office will supply dial tone. Once the dial tone is there, you have talk battery across the line, and at that point the audible signal associated with the coins, the beep beep, sounds. But of course at this point in the call there's no one and nothing listening for that sound, it just plays over the dial tone. At that point you dial your number, and if the call did not go through, Your dime is returned using 130 volts DC. That signal comes from the central office. In one polarity it returns the coin, in the other polarity it collects it. And of course that is done at the end of the phone call. Prepay operation is very rare in independent phone companies. The second most common method is dial tone first operation, becoming increasingly more common as the 70s decade progresses. An example of this would be St. Augustine, Florida. Here, you pick up the phone and get a dial tone. You can then dial long distance and emergencies without putting a coin in. But for local calls, you're supposed to deposit a dime, or a quarter in this case, as soon as you get the dial tone. So it's dial tone first, first the dial tone, then the deposit. But if you try to dial a local call without making the initial deposit, at some point something will detect that there's no coin and give you a special recording. In number one step, the coin test usually occurs on the third or fourth digit of the number you dial. This makes it possible to dial something like 411 without a coin. But for a regular local call, the call you have made requires a 25 cent deposit before dialing. Please hang up momentarily. Wait for dial tone. Deposit 25 cents and dial your call again. The call you have made requires a 25 cent deposit before dialing. Please hang up momentarily. At the end of a normal local call, you do get collect or return, and that is the same as in prepay operation, 130 volts. But after the collect or return, you just get another dial tone, instead of going to a dead line again. Those two examples I gave were Bell System number 1 steps. Dial tone first never was developed on panel, but it was implemented on number 1 crossbar, number 5 crossbar, and the ESS systems. In New York City during the 1970s, all of the outdoor phones were dial tone first, usually on number one crossbar, while the indoor phones were almost always prepay, often on panel. Here is one of those 
outdoor dial tone first phones. This call is from a crossbar one office and it happens to be routing the call through a panel office selector tandem. The call is actually starting to go through in spite of the fact that there's no dime in the phone. For that reason, after we dial the third digit, you'll actually hear a panel brush and group pulsing occur. That's from the revertive pulse conversation between the panel office selector tandem and the Ho Avenue crossbar one we're calling from. The next four digits are dialed pretty quickly, so you don't hear the revertive pulsing that is starting to happen. But after the last digit of the phone number, there's a ground test. At that point, the originating register sender finds out that there's no coin, and so it calls the marker again, requesting a reroute to the dial tone first intercept recording. you have made requires a 10 cent deposit. Please hold on, wait for dial tone, deposit 10 cents, and dial your call again. Now if that doesn't sound like the Bronx, I don't know what does. Please hold on. Just kidding. The Jane Barbie recordings didn't turn up until the late 70s. Actually, the original New York dial tone first recording, the one we remember so well, was voiced by an announcer that we have not heard anywhere else. Here it is from the Newtown Central Office in Queens. This was recorded from the Woodside Long Island Railroad Station. I was there with Dave one day. I'm trying to dial 958 without a coin in. That's the number readback. And you have to put in a coin, so I just got the recording. requires a 10 cent deposit. Please hold on, wait for dial tone, deposit 10 cents, and dial your call again. That's the recording that we heard for most of the 70s through all of the city. Just to show you how phone freaks are always thinking the same, here's what happened next. I did put in a coin and tried 958 only to get a reorder. Why was it busy? Why, of course, Dave was using it. So I jokingly yell at him to get off 958, and then I finally do get through. Newtown office happens to have cable test tone on some of its return supplies. So when the 130 volts comes, so does that tone. It's the only office I think that has that. It's a mistake. Dial tone first on number 5 crossbar is a little simpler because the call does not start to go through until after the dime is confirmed, thus there's no need for a second marker call. But that's just the nature of number 5 crossbar. The originating register makes a ground test by cutting the battery momentarily, and when there's no dime, it tells the marker about that, which routes the call to the intercept recording. But of course, not all intercept recordings are hooked up exactly right. That was the situation in City Island. Here's what would happen if you dialed a local call there without a dime in. requires a 10 cent deposit. Please hold on, wait for dial tone, deposit 10 cents, and dial your call again. Now as for dial tone first on number one ESS, I have to dig pretty deep to find any recordings of that. We have a lot of number one ESS on tape, but most of the phones we used were prepay. 
Here's one from New York City, of all places. It happens to be on a number one ESS that is brand new, having replaced a panel in late 1975. In number one ESS, as in crossbar one, the coin test is right after the last digit of the number. It makes a very specific set of clicks. The clicks are fairly complicated because there's actually a switching operation where your line is literally taken off the CDPR and connected to some coin test and control equipment for just a second and then put back where it was. And so that's why it makes so many clicks. After the coin test, a local call will proceed normally just as it would from a prepay coin phone. There's a lot of power noise on that call from the nearby subway. You can actually hear a train starting up and all sorts of stuff like that, but the point is that on real dial tone first in a number one ESS, you do get a sound like this after the last digit. Now, as I said, the dial tone first recording we all grew up with was this one. The call you have made requires a 10 cent deposit. Please hold on. Which is not the famous New York telephone Owen Murphy voice. It's not Jane Barbie either. It wasn't until 1976, actually, when Ben and I were dialing from a brand new ESS office in Brooklyn that we finally dialed a local call without a coin in. Well, here's what happened. The call you have made requires a 10 cent deposit. Please hang up. Wait for dial tone, deposit 10 cents, and dial your call again. In an emergency, dial zero, no coin required. The call you have made requires a 10 cent deposit. Please hang up. So that's genuine dial tone first on number one ESS. Now let's move on to the system that is so common among many of my phone trips that half the time I don't even mention it and that is post-pay operation. In independent companies, post-pay operation is very simple because it's all done by the coin phone. You can dial local calls freely and the call just goes through, but the polarity reversal on the phone line when the party answers triggers something in the payphone itself to cut off your mouthpiece so that the party cannot hear you until you make the initial deposit. Once you do, your mouthpiece is connected and you can talk. There is no coin collect or return signal because every coin dropped into the phone goes right into the coin box. If you deposit too soon, you lose the money. Postpay in independent companies is so well represented due to my many phone trips already on this web page that I won't repeat it here. However, there was a version of Postpay used in the Bell system. This was different from the independent version because the central office was involved in the coin control. It was only used in small step CDOs and even then, only certain areas of the country had it. Here's a local call dialed from Bogart, Statham, Georgia to Athens, Georgia. Of course, I don't have to put a dime in to make the call, but when the party answers, you get a second dial tone. The second dial tone is coming from the central office. When you deposit a dime, the payphone signals the central office and the dial tone is replaced by the sound of the party. You can then talk. What's interesting here is that the post-pay phones are two-wire, 
they don't have a ground connection. When I first encountered a post-pay phone line in the Bell system, it was very strange to find out that when I hooked up a regular 500 set to that phone line, I still got the second dial tone. For a while there, I didn't know how to break it. What on earth could that payphone be doing to signal the central office that a dime had been put in when it doesn't even have a ground wire? Well, this question actually stumped me. I couldn't think rationally about it. But when I ran it by Ben, he guessed it right away, suggesting that maybe the phone temporarily puts a mute on the line. In other words, maybe it goes from fully off hook to having, say, three to 4,000 ohms across tip and ring, and then back again. Well, that idea sounded outlandish, but you know, that is exactly what it was doing. When you put the dime in, it temporarily puts 3,650 ohms across tip and ring, just for an instant. Where does it get that resistance from? It puts the bell coil, both windings of it, in series across the phone line with no capacitor, for just an instant. That's what signals the CO to let you talk on the local call. Now, General Telephone especially likes a type of setup called semi-dial tone first. In the strange world of semi-dial tone first, you pick up the phone and get a dial tone, but you can't dial anything at all, including operator, until you put a coin in. Here's an example of this from Monroe, North Carolina. When I pick up the phone, I get a dial tone from the first selector. When the dime goes in the phone, you can hear an audible click, which is coming from the central office, which indicates that the relays did detect the ground that the payphone put on the line. Since the local call did not complete, there is a normal coin return at the end, which is then followed by another dial tone, of course. have reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service in the 753 office. If you feel you have reached its recording an error, please check the number or try your call again. Now in the AE system of semi-dial tone first, it is the central office and not the telephone itself which prevents rotary dialing from doing anything until you make the initial deposit. Unfortunately, I learned this so early in my telephone career that I stopped trying, so that by the time the tapes were rolling, there aren't any recordings of trying to do it and showing what happens. So you'll just have to take my word for it, but I can assure you that I tried flashing, and the phone itself was letting the flash go through to the CO. There was no problem. You could hook flash all you wanted. Not only that, but on a rotary dial phone, you could rotary dial all you wanted. The pulses did go down the line, they just didn't do anything. You really had to make the initial deposit. Then the CO would actually break the dial tone and let the selector move or whatever. Semi-dial tone first also works in areas that have the 102 director system, where dial tone comes from a register sender, which then sets up the call, dialing something cryptic, usually, into the step switching train that's behind it. In this example, from the north side of Charlottesville, Virginia, there's a click when the dime goes in that is just like the click in a normal step. Now when touch tone is involved, that makes it a little more complicated because in this AE system, while the CO is what's responsible for preventing rotary dialing without the initial deposit, the phone is what's responsible for not allowing touch tones. 
And this part I've got a tape to prove, although it's a low-quality tape. This is from Durham, North Carolina, from an unrecordable phone, but here at least you can tell that this is not dial tone first, it's semi-dial tone first. I pick up the phone, narrate to the tape, dial zero, and my touch tone is just a barely audible noise. Then I make the initial deposit, which was 20 cents, and it works. Okay, um, let me check the local exchanges. Oh, dial zero. I had to go back to 1975 to get even a recording of that much proof that it really was semi-dial tone first. Because I'd given up on trying to defeat it long ago. In fact, Durham, North Carolina was one of the most frustrating experiences I'd ever had in the telephone network. Simply because whenever you'd hit a vacant code, it was wired to just sit there until whatever time you gave up on dialing. Ten seconds after you finally gave up, no matter how many digits you dialed, then it would go to vacant code. I'm sorry, the number you have reached is not in service at this time. If you need assistance, please hang up and dial your operator. This is a Durham, North Carolina recording. This behavior was such a disincentive to experimenting with the system that I ended up incorporating it as a security feature in a telephone system I designed in the 1980s. Semi-dial tone first was always a bit of a kludge, and there wasn't one system used everywhere. The AE system is what I was just demonstrating. Now here's an NX1 in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania with a similar system. This NX1 has a strange dial tone. It's two tones, but not the usual two. In any event, here's the sound of Dave picking up a phone and trying to dial zero first without a coin, and you can see the phone is preventing it. Then he puts in a coin and it works. So the phone is what prevented him from touch-tone dialing without a coin. But what if he wants to flash? Can the phone stop him from doing that? Well, the answer is no. The central office has to do that. Now in the AE system, rotary dialing, or doing it with the hook switch, is ignored, unless the payphone itself is grounding the line because you made the initial deposit. But this NX1 does it a little differently. In fact, why don't you guess? What do you think the NX1 might do? to indicate that the call can't be completed. How might it respond in this particular situation where the call can't go through yet? I mean, you're trying to dial a number and you don't have a dime in yet, so it's got to do something, or at least ignore it. So of all the possible responses that it might make, what response do you think? Nah, it gives you recording. Just kidding. Here's what happened when we tried dialing a rotary dial digit with no coin in. And now, with a coin in, here's flashing 411. Assistance? Directory assistance, may I help you? In the Bell system, whenever they test for the presence of a coin, they cut the talk battery. But independent companies don't seem to share that philosophy. 
So you have here a piece of hardware for receiving digits, in this case the NX1's Rego, doing something that the comparable hardware in Bell system offices could never do. In number 1 and number 5 crossbar, the originating registers can test for ground, but to do that they have to momentarily cut the talk battery. Thus in number 5, when it's going to test for ground before completing the call, will do this, instead of just this. We now come to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. This was a municipal phone company that did things a little bit differently. I wish I'd been able to make high quality recordings from Chapel Hill, but all the coin phones were very old, had no electromagnetic leakage on the earpiece, and thus I had to take a suction cup pickup coil, one of those lousy things that never works well anyway, and just find a spot on the phone where I could pick up some of the sound. I do recall that it kept falling off. Now the instructions for using the phone were consistent with semi-dial tone first, and the AE sounding equipment would make you expect that nothing was out of the ordinary. But as you can see, in the second one of these phone calls, you can simply flash a local call without putting a dime in. So first I'll put in 10 cents, and then dial my number, at the end of the call, the coins are returned, and then you'll hear me quickly flashing a local call. I'm only dialing the last five digits, but that's really neither here nor there. It doesn't matter. It works. Let me dial my own 968 number. What was unique about Chapel Hill was that every time a local call would answer, the polarity reversal would cause your coin to drop into the coin box immediately. That is, if you bothered to put a coin in the phone, which you didn't have to do. The only thing putting the coin in would do is let you use the rotary dial, which, as you just saw, was really not necessary. At the end of every call, there was a coin return, and maybe even a coin collect signal on the calls that answered, I don't know. One thing's for sure, though, by the time that coin control signal was sent at the end of an answered call, there wasn't any coin in the phone to be collected by it. The collect occurred on the answer. Other semi-dial tone first arrangements did exist out there, and Nantes-Quebec was one of them. In Nantes-Quebec, the central office still sent a collect or a return at the end of every call, but the telephone itself was responsible for making sure you paid for a local call. It was a touchtone phone. You couldn't use the dial unless a coin was in. But you could flash phone numbers with the hook switch to your heart's content. The only trouble was that once a local call answered, the polarity reversal would cause the phone to cut your mouthpiece and earpiece off unless there was a coin in the phone. So there were two layers of protection. The dial wouldn't work unless you had a coin, and then if you went ahead and flashed a number anyway, the polarity reversal would get you. Way off in the background you may have heard the tone that actually answered this number but because there's no coin in, the phone is cutting the sound off. When you call this particular number with a coin in the phone, you actually hear the tone that it answers with. <coughs> Chapel Hill, I don't think, had that particular protection. It was very, very free to flash to your heart's content and talk, if I recall correctly. Now, my favorite overall system for semi-dial tone first is what I found in Guadalajara and Mexico City in 1974. The first thing I noticed when I picked up the payphone is how the switch hook rose when you took the receiver off of it. 
because rather than just coming up quickly, it rode up very slowly, and you could hear a mechanism inside the phone. That is a very rough approximation of what it sounded like. I actually don't have any recordings of this. In retrospect, it's pretty impressive because the phones were very smart. The only signal that they got from the central office was the polarity reversal when a local call answered. Other than that, the phone itself did all the coin control work. Everything centered around that mechanism associated with the switch hook. Now, inside the phone, there was a switch that would hang it up and pick it up, but you couldn't get at that switch. You only had the outer switch hook to work with, and this mechanism would actually put a time delay in between your hanging up and picking up that thing and the inner switch opening and closing. It made it impossible to do quick flashes, so you couldn't dial phone numbers by hitting the switch hook repeatedly. And thus, if you wanted to dial a number, you actually had to put a coin in the phone. Imagine that, because the dial wouldn't work without it. Being forced by this time delay switch hook to use the rotary dial meant that any time you were on a phone call, there was a coin in the phone. And as soon as a local call answered, that coin would drop into the coin box. I'm pretty sure that was done with polarity reversal from the CO, but in any case, that was the only communication between the CO and the phone, other than perhaps an incoming call making it ring. As for coin return, all you had to do was hang up the phone. If the number you dialed had not answered, the coin would still be there, and as soon as the inner switch hook got to the bottom, your coin would just fall out but there was no way to bang the external switch hook and fool it into returning your coin and leaving a call up. So this was a semi-dial tone first system that could not be defeated. One of the unanswered questions I have is from Montreal in 1974. It was my first trip to Canada, and I wasn't alone. I was kind of stuck with parents, so there wasn't time to discover all the nuances of the system. In one part of downtown Montreal, I found regular prepay, the prepay phones I found were still three-slot phones using the mechanical gongs. But in another part of downtown, and in Westmount, Bell Canada was using a coin control system that was completely unconventional for the Bell system. This was either a semi-dial tone first system, or it was a crude dial tone first system. Which it was depends upon whether you could actually use the dial to call short numbers like 0 or 911 without putting a coin in and I had so little time I didn't try it. But whatever it was, it was implemented using the Northern Electric Centurion phones of the time, single slot, plastic front. Here's an example of it from a number one ESS in downtown Montreal. You'll notice that I pick up the phone and get a dial tone, indicating that this is not a prepay coin phone. I'll put in a dime and dial the first six digits of a local call. Now, this so far sounds exactly like dial tone first on a number one ESS. When I dial the seventh digit, there should be a coin test. Here goes. Hey, where's the coin test? It doesn't care. The call's going through anyway. And there you go. Totally abnormal. No coin test. The phone itself is what's responsible for making sure you put a coin in, and all it can do is prevent you from using the dial or touchtone pad. And that is really weird, because here we are in a Bell System city, at least in the 70s it was, picking up the phone and getting a dial tone from a number one ESS, no ground start, but then there's no ground test either at the end of the number. Hard to believe it happened. Let's listen to one more call. <laughs> I am sorry, there is no service for the number you have dialed. I think that that particular hybrid that I found in Montreal was probably completely freakable, as long as it was on number one ESS and not a step. Here's why I think that. 
In number one ESS, there is no polarity reversal on local calls. That means the telephone itself cannot tell when the called party has answered. Now Northern Telecom Centurion phones allow you to flash numbers with the hook switch freely. It's very easy to flash numbers. And so I see no reason why I couldn't have picked up that phone in Montreal and flashed local calls without putting a coin in and been able to talk to the person when they answered because the CO doesn't stop the call from going through. The phone doesn't stop you from talking or flashing. There's just no way to prevent it. Now, when that system is used on a step, the phone can detect the polarity reversal when the local call answers and not let you talk unless your dime is in. But on an ESS, I think it was wide open. Chances are I'll never find out. Just to round this out, I think I should mention that the semi-dial tone first did get replaced with real dial tone first in many areas, and that did start happening in the late 70s before the old switching systems were replaced. I have here, for example, a recording of an NX1 in northern Florida, which clearly has dial tone first. It's also a strange and perhaps unique anachronism in that this is a three-slot touch tone payphone with dial tone first. Maybe the only example I have. Now how the NX1 is detecting the ground signal from the payphone is not clear. So it may be that the regos in this office are able to detect that ground without cutting battery, just like whatever equipment used to do that in the semi-dial tone first systems in the steps. Again, that's something the Bell system would never do. They would always drop battery to test for ground. In any event, here's a local call. Notice how I can dial the first two digits without putting the coin in. I didn't play with it enough to know exactly how many digits you could dial, but you certainly could call operator with no coin. Now if the NX1 can do dial tone first without actually cutting battery to test for ground, you would think that GTE's steps, long champions of testing for ground without cutting battery, thanks to their years of semi-dial tone first, you'd think these steps would do it that way too. But surprisingly, when they switched from semi-dial tone first to dial tone first, they began testing for ground by cutting the battery momentarily, just as the bell system would do. Here's a regular step in Bradenton, Florida. This is the GTE area. And you'll notice after the seventh digit, it tests for ground. As some of you know, 958 has long been a test code and not assignable for phone numbers. Well, in the 1970s, there was a 958 exchange in the Sarasota area. I did arrive in Sarasota just a few months too late to actually record calling the 958 exchange successfully. So what I did there was dial another number that went to intercept and give the 958 number to the intercept operator, who at least still knew about it. But if anybody ever tells you they used to have a 958 number, you can just say, hey, you used to live in Sarasota, and never mind the area code, because that was the only one in the North American network. Anyway, here's what happens in the Bradenton step if you dial a local call without a dime in. Oh, 
requires a coin deposit before dialing. Please hang up for a moment and then try your call again. This is a recording. The number you dial requires... In Sarasota itself, there was a 102 director system in use, and surprisingly, they implemented dial tone first in a way that did not make use of the rerouting feature of the director system. Now, had that been made 10 years earlier, I'm sure what would have happened is that on the seventh digit, when it discovered there was no dime, the director system would have rerouted you, dialing something to get you to the recording. But as you'll hear here, the ground test occurs on the seventh digit, and then the recording just comes on, just as it did in the Bradenton step, which doesn't have a director. So clearly this was something that was sort of slapped on after the fact, not integrated into the switching system. requires a coin deposit before dialing. Please hang up for a moment and then try your call again. This is a recording. The number you dial requires a coin deposit before dialing. Please hang up for a moment and then try your call again. This is a recording. The number you dial requires a coin deposit before dialing. There's nothing like 102 director power noise. There really is nothing like it. No other part of the network did have this particular sound. And by the way, if you were far away from the central office, you didn't get to hear it because most of it is above four kilohertz. In fact, when I first posted the Elizabeth City tapes on the web, we were using a codec that couldn't go that high, and so a lot of the real sound of it was lost, but not anymore. Well, before I go, here's one last example of dial tone first being implemented in an independent company. And this is actually not a kludge. This is built into the switch. The Stromberg ESC had a creepy way of just knowing whether your dime was in or not without doing any noticeable ground test. So whatever piece of equipment gives you dial tone and receives your digits has ground testing capability, just like the AE semi-dial tone first equipment. In the examples that I saw, all that would happen is that whenever the switch would normally take action, usually the third digit, in an intra-office call, the seventh, at that point, a reorder would just come on if your dime wasn't there. It just knew. Here's a local call with a dime. This is the ESC in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Always get friendly personal service at Rock Hill National Bank. Time seven five. Temperature seventy four. This being an ESC, after the coin collect, instead of going back to dial tone, it put us on lockout. And of course, you have to flash from lockout to get a new dial tone. Good old ESC. I never thought that it would be completely removed from the network in such a short time. Well, it's been quite a trip up and down the East Coast here, but we've actually touched upon every coin control method I've encountered, except for some minor variations in independent dial tone first and semi-DTF, except for one, Harrisonburg, Virginia. As I said, it's not earth-shattering, but it's unique. Now, the Harrisonburg step itself is fairly typical, except for its coin control method, until you get into part two of that series where we start calling into the tributaries and hearing some of that weird, really weird carrier noise. To me, it's like a foreign country. Anyway, the Harrisonburg series starts next, and at first it's 
just a step with weird coin control.